Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to this Inside Scientific, Scientist.com, and Crown Bioscience webinar titled, What's Next in Preclinical Cancer Immunotherapy Research? I'm Liam Sanyo from the events team here at Scientist.com, and I'll be the host today. From the Crown Bioscience team, our panel consists of Dr. Kara Hovers, Director of Immuno-Oncology, Dr. Ludovic Bure, Vice President and Head of Research and Innovation, and Dr. Leo Price, Senior Vice President of InVitro and Head of, Res er, and Head of Crown Bioscience Netherlands. So today we're going to be discussing key topics in the field of immunotherapy, including new and emerging methods, recent publications, and future directions. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Hera, Ludwig, and Leo to the virtual stage. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. It's great to have you all with us. Thanks, Leo. Fantastic. Well, uh, maybe we can kick things off with a bit of a recap question here. Uh, so why is the cancer immunity cycle relevant to the development of cancer therapeutics? So Hera, maybe you can lead this one. Yeah, well, thanks, Liam. So I think indeed, if we look in the development for drugs in uh, cancer therapeutics, by now we all know that um, the, the, the first line of treatment or the standard of care that we have been using for a long time is not always the solution for, um, um, for each indication or for each patient. And I think, yeah, it's nice that uh, we had this whole webinar series, of course, where we introduced and, and looked at the cancer immunity cycle, how we can make use of this cycle to uh, analyze different steps uh, in this cycle that are uh, that are actually um, uh, subscribed or sorry are described. Um, so it's it, we can make use of this cancer immunity cycle to uh, to better understand uh, immunotherapies. So for example, all the different steps that are um, described that are necessary for a proper uh, anti-cancer immune response uh, can play a role. And this cycle can basically be, be off, right? So you can imagine that if one of those uh, steps is, is not correct anymore, um, that then uh, there's no uh, use of the immune system to basically attack the tumor cells. And by making this balance more complete again um, and, and analyzing which steps uh, your immunotherapies can actually help, um, then we can make this uh, cancer immunity cycle work and making sure to support immune cells um, in killing the tumor. So, um, yeah, during the webinars, I think we nicely described and, and had a look on those different steps. And we also showed uh, which type of technologies we could, uh, we have available in Crown Bioscience in our in vitro capacity to actually uh, analyze those steps. Um, and those steps, uh, yeah, as I said, if, if all of those are, um, are working in, in a right way, then that could lead to, a, to the right immune response that we are, uh, are aiming for. So I think, yeah, during those webinars, we, uh, we nicely presented those different steps and um, yeah, the cycle can really help us in, uh, in drug discovery for uh, cancer immunotherapies. Fantastic. Um, all right, so next one here, and uh, maybe, maybe Ludo, you can lead this one, but which new and emerging methodologies are you most excited about and why? Um, I think this is a great question for everyone, but yeah, Ludo, maybe you can lead this one. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Lang, for the, the great question. Uh, so I think there is many uh, exciting space in the in, the in vitro settings. Uh, so obviously, uh, during the webinar series, we will talk about a lot of uh, around organoids, and, and definitely this is a, a very exciting field uh, where this has been shown that those models are very transactional compared to, uh, to the clinic. Uh, I would say today, uh, most of the settings uh, is to grow those organoids in, uh, in 3D matrix, but obviously uh, the tumor microenvironment is much more complex than uh, the single uh, tumor cells. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of uh, today research and activity to, to set up more complex uh, 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 in vitro model. Uh, to mimic better the, the tumor microenvironment, so for for instance, to have uh, vascularization or and also stroma cells, uh, which is very important, as there is a cross crosstalk between the stroma cells and tumor cells uh, that have been uh, shown to to uh, to really uh, boost the, the the tumor growth. Uh, so actually, and and, and the current bioscience, there we are working on this to make a more complex uh, 3D models with co-culture with other cells like endothelial cells, stroma cells. And also obviously uh, what we talk about is the immuno-oncology to, 
incorporate uh, immune cells uh, in those environments. So uh, obviously uh, T cells, which is one of the major uh, focus, but now there is a lot of intuitions also on the myeloid cells like macrophages or uh, also uh, myeloid derived cells or dendritic cells. So all those components uh, is, is very critical uh, to have a much more translational model uh, as well. Uh, so I think all those areas are very exciting. There have been a lot of progress. Also, uh, incorporating NK cell for cell therapy product, for instance, uh, uh, also is, is very something uh, interesting. Also, uh, um, like by specific antibodies. Uh, so, uh, have this recapitulated uh, tumor microenvironment is, is very uh, is very critical. Uh, also, another technology that could be applied is the CRISPR uh, for gene editing. Uh, we can uh, actually engineer those organoids model easier to, under, to understand better, I would say, the organs uh, development, but also to mimic human disease, like to induce specific mutation, uh, and also to understand better the drug resistance. Uh, so using CRISPR is really a great platform uh, also to look at new uh, target, uh, target identification using CRISPR screen, for instance. Uh, and also we can use CRISPR to, to tag those models, so induce like luciferase or fluorescence protein. Uh, and basically we can use those models after in animal settings. So we can use organoids that will reimplant uh, in autotopic setting in animals models. Uh, and this is very great tools uh, uh, compared to, I would say, to engineering animals model that takes much more long time. Uh, to generate uh, like uh, genetic engineering or mouse model. Uh, so all those, uh, I would say, technology uh, around the, uh, gene editing it also have a great application in the, in the organoid space. I mean, if I can add to that, I mean, I think that, you know, Crown has aimed to make the most, to be able to provide the most translational models and the most well known for the animal models. And, you know, there's this, vast collection of pdx models you know humanized um uh, mouse models and i as that's what they're most you know crown are most sort of well known for but i think the the introduction of the organoids has really uh given a huge boost for in vitro uh biology you know this this platform has a lot of additional characteristics which really put it above the conventional 2d models you know, not only do you have um, a sort of three-dimensional tissue, uh, but these are derived from, from stem cells and they've not been endlessly passaged on plastic. So it's been shown that they're really much more translational and match the, the, the original patient tumor. You know, the other thing is, is that the, the organoids, unlike cell lines, which have been, you know, collected up from all different labs around the world, they've been grown up with all sorts of different media and using different methodologies they're really you know are the differences in responses of cell lines because of the the genetics or other characteristics or is it just because of the way that they were developed so the organoid technology is a very standardized technology so we have panels of organoids with about 500 of uh, different organoids now which have all been generated using exactly the same methodology so then when you take a collection of uh, of organoids with different mutational backgrounds and you see different responses to therapeutics it's much more likely that that's due to that different biology rather than the fact that you've someone might have used different media or something in their preparation so so the organoids are, i think are provide a great step forward and another thing i think about this platform is this the availability of normal healthy tissues from the same patient, which allows you to match the tumor and the normal next to each other, gives you more of an insight into a therapeutic window. And I think that's something obviously you don't have with cancer cell lines. There's no normal normal tissue with them. So the organoids have been a, you know, a great um, step forward in in vitro. But I think you know, what's really exciting now is to see you know, how much further can we get, close, closer to, can we get to, to the patient and one big step forward is is really using ex, ex vivo patient tissue, and and this is something that we've been developing in, in Crown now for a few years, and are now offering as a service where tumor is coming directly from surgery from patients, 
and within 24 hours going into the assay and 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 we're able to test therapeutics and and i think this opens up um great new uh opportunities you know there's staying much more close to the original patient tumor both in terms of the time that this that it's been out of uh, uh out of the body they haven't had time to drift and and another very important factor is is that that what comes with that are the uh, the, um, the tumor microenvironment and the immune cells therein. So that's uh, that, that offers a, you know, that's really new emerging technology that that's you know really pushing things closer and closer towards the patient. Yeah, I I couldn't agree agree more, uh, Leo, with that. And and what I think is really interesting is when we actually compare these two models that we uh, that actually both uh, you and uh, Ludo just described, right? So on one hand, we have reconstituted models. So the setup is really flexible. We can make use of organoids. Uh, we can add the different uh, players that we think are playing an important role in the tumor microenvironment, but it's in a controlled setting, right? So we can add uh, immune cells, we can add myelin cells, uh, but we can also add, for example, a fibroblast or other cellular players that we think are important in, uh, in actually this tumor microenvironment. So on one hand, we have these reconstituted models, and then indeed, on the other hand, we have this native tumor microenvironment. So if we work with this patient material by not performing any expansion or actually thereby selection for certain cellular players in this tumor microenvironment, uh, really maintaining um, the, the tumor microenvironment as we find it in the patient. It's really bringing those assays to a really uh, clin clinically relevant uh, assay that we can use. And what's interesting is that both of these technologies can be used in, in a high throughput screening platform. And I would say um, the high throughputness is probably uh, even higher for these reconstituted models, right? So um, the, the organoids that we have, the immune cells, and we can really be flexible in the setup, but also a material is in that sense, a little bit less of a limitation. So we can really perform uh, combinational treatments, uh, screenings. Um, so we can even do uh, a library screen of a certain compound um, and really yeah, extract a lot of data out of those reconstituted models. And although this, this uh, patient material that we have, we can also perform a screening uh, on, on that, which is uh, yeah, really bringing much more value um, and it, as mentioned, this tissue is really clinically le relevant because we are really putting the patient in a disc in a, in a, in the lab, and thereby um, actually performing an in vitro clinical trial. So that's really uh, that's really great. And both of these technologies that do have a screening capacity, making use of our high content imaging technology that we have, we can also really dive into uh, the mechanism of action, but also in the functional readouts. Um, uh, that we see happening by using this imaging technology. So we are not looking at, um, for example, only one immune cell population. Does it increase or does it reduce? Uh, but really looking at the complete uh, situation as how we had it uh, in the dish, basically, right? So either on the reconstituted or in the complete uh, patient, uh, we are analyzing as a whole and thereby yeah, using these functional readouts is really uh, bringing much more value um, uh, to uh, to hopefully in the end the patients, uh, but also to push the drug development of uh, of immunotherapies. So I think indeed having on one hand organoid technology, making use of CRISPR, this huge biobank that we can use. So uh, materials already genetically characterized, right? So we can you can pick your uh, uh, model of interest based on on sort of target expression, and then on the other hand, having indeed this patient uh, platform available. Uh, and really, um, uh, yeah, making the translation to the clinics um, are uh, are really exciting uh, new me methodologies in this field of preclinical testing uh, in uh, in the in vitro uh, uh, space. Yeah, great answer. Definitely, lots of uh, technologies to keep an eye on. Um, so, a nice follow up question to that one: uh, How do you think these new methodologies are going to impact drug development? So, uh, Leo, maybe you can lead this one. I think one of the main the main impacts will be on improving the efficiency of selection, and I think that's going to have impact on in vitro and in vivo phases. I think with a more complex biology that we have, for example, with organoids or the uh, patient tissues, 
we're, we're going to be able to better triage compounds and make a more um, uh, valid uh, triaging selection of compounds that go into the next phase. And I think that the impact of that will be that um, the in subsequent preclinical in vivo studies will generate a higher proportion of positive data. I think that the these the in vivo studies will be become less and less used for selection of compounds and more for validation of the data that's already been generated in vitro, and also, of course, to give uh, insight into mechanism of action. So I think that that kind of cost efficiency is going to play out. And maybe also uh, important to mention, I guess, is that in uh, especially if you look in uh, cancer immunotherapies, um, where of course there's a, a well a lot of uh, people in the field um, since the development of the immune checkpoint inhibitors, a lot of people in the field are of course interesting interested to actually see um, their um, yeah there's still limitations, let's say, in the success for patients right of, on treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and actually, one of the reasons why we are still maybe lacking there is um, because of the right in vitro models to, to actually recapitulate and measure sensitivity towards immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. So I think there, especially the, the patient uh, material that we, that we just described, um, if we put this in a, in a dish, we really observe that um, those patients uh, show a similarity um, in their uh, sensitivity to immune checkpoint inhibitors as we see in the clinics. So I think therefore this technology is really interesting um, and really this um, ex vivo patient uh, platform that we can use uh, and actually maintaining this native tumor mic environment seems to be playing a crucial role in uh, still maintaining uh, sensitivity to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I think this was also um, coming out of the webinars, um, one of the uh, yeah, questions asked uh, more often by the audience, like which assays are available to, uh, to check for immune checkpoint uh, sensitivity. I think really using patient material with native tumor microenvironment is, uh, is pushing this one uh, forward. So that's really a great, uh, great development that could help for um, uh, yeah, drug development in immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Yeah, maybe I, I can add one, one more comment on what Leo and, and Gera um, just just mentioned. So I think indeed I, I, I do think as well that that's going to really help to have a, a better selection of, 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 of compounds before going in in uh, in, in vivo uh, uh, studies. Uh, both, I would say, on the efficacy, but I think also on the uh, uh, toxicology on, on those molecules. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's going to have a big impact today. Most of the molecules that fail in clinic are not due to the efficacy, but more the challenge on, on the, uh, on the safety. Uh, so those, uh, preclinical approach using organoids in oncology or immune oncology settings, uh, I think gonna help to, to address those questions and, and have a, a better refinement of the drug at early stage. Uh, that will foster I would say, the, the drug development. Yeah. I think maybe one other point that um, to, to worthwhile mention is actually, and I think we already discussed this within um, our webinars, uh, but there's also uh, two different, uh, and, and also just mentioned by Leo, but there are two different type of organoids available. So there are organoids that are directly uh, coming from the, from the patient uh, uh, derived. There are also organoids that we generate from our white collection of PDX uh, mice. And by, by having both organoids um, to use in an in vitro testing and screening for, for compounds, um, that's really uh, on, on one hand. And then that could also lead to selection for indication to follow up with which in vivo models you want to uh, uh, follow up. So really aligning these um, models and first doing screening on in vitro on those PDXO derived organoids um, can nicely be follow up with in vivo studies. Um, and I think uh, recently this year, we, uh, also Crown Bioscience published another paper in, in PLOS One where we actually made those uh, comparisons um, uh, and published this. And I think what's really nice, uh, nicely demonstrated that, for example, 
um, different type of, of therapies like biospecific antibodies, but also uh, cellular therapies like CAR T cells. Um, those can be tested as, as shown uh, in actually in this graph uh, that indeed um, uh, those organoid models really showed nice sensitivity upon treatment with those specific um, CAR T cells. So that's really, um, yeah, I think also will really help in, in other fields of uh, immunotherapies. Um, these uh, these new uh, advanced uh, methodologies that uh, are developed. Yeah, excellent. Great answers all. Um, all right. So uh, do you think these changes are going to enable faster development of immunotherapeutics? Um, and Ludo, what do you think? Yeah, so I just, as we just discussed a little bit before, uh, uh, I think that indeed that to have, uh, I would say, organoids uh, or ex vivo tissue uh, platform tissue are uh, really going to help to to have a better understanding of uh, of mechanism of action of of, of uh, immunotherapies or I would say uh, drugs that target immunomodulation in, in general. Uh, so I think those those parts are going to be. Uh, critical in the future uh, to to uh, to refine, as we we just mentioned, uh, drug selection before going in in vivo model. Uh, so actually, uh, on the slide that you just show on on the on the presentation, uh, we do see how on the left side, uh, so the, the different in vitro approach that we just mentioned, uh, organoid or ex vivo tissue platform either for oncology or immunology. On the right side, uh, the different uh, mouse platform that we have uh, today at, at Cron. Um, so I think those two in vitro and vivo anyway are very complementary. They can address different uh, different questions. Uh, for instance, uh, for to focus on, on the different animal platform, uh, Sangenic model have been the the horse uh, uh, work for for evaluating uh, oncology drugs, but also immunology drugs. However, uh, this is a, a mouse immune system uh, with using a mouse tumor, so the biology could be different, and, and there is definitely some some limitation. Uh, gem mouse model also have been uh, largely used in the past. Uh, some models are, are still very relevant and very translational compared to the clinics. Uh, like the uh, KPC for prokaryotic model, this model has been shown to really recapitulate uh, the same feature compared to the uh, 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 cancer in, in, in patients. Uh, but however, still, I would say, uh, uh, the mouse biology. Uh, so Crown have built a very large uh, collection of patient derived xenographs, so PX have been uh, since uh, here now for, for a long time, and I've shown their uh, translational relevance compared to cell line derived xenographs. Uh, so today we have a very large panel, more, more than uh, three 3,000 PDX model in different indication. And actually, uh, we have used those PDX actually to generate organoids, uh, to generate PDX. So, so uh, it's a very great platform because the client can start to with the uh, PDXO uh, to, to screen their drugs and then after move forward in, the, in some selected model to, to in vivo model. Uh, and the PDX can be used, I would say, in uh, immunodeficient mice or without uh, immuno, uh, uh, immuno compartment, uh, but they can be humanized either using PBMC or, or stem cells uh, to recapitulate, I would say, partially uh, the human immune system. Uh, so those those models have some some still some limitation, uh, but they can address some of the question. Uh, I think each model need to re clearly understand in terms of limitation and see if they can answer what question we we want to answer. Uh, but yeah, once again, I think those uh, in vitro and vivo are, are very complementary and and make a, a lot of uh, sense to. To go through the organoids platform first and then after moving to, to, to in vivo model. Uh, also, we have done a lot of characterization of those uh, data sets either in vitro or in vivo that are 
a lot of characterization that have been done, and this is mentioned uh, actually on the uh, right uh, side of the of the slide. There is different database where uh, a range of information are included here, uh, like standard of care, uh, uh, genetic information with some sequencing data, looking at gene expression, mutation, but also proteomics data. So there is a huge number of information are available for all clients uh, that can help on, on, on the selection of the, of the model. Yeah, great points. Um, all right, well, uh, I think, you know, great question here um, about AI. I think we'd be amiss if we didn't talk about that considering it's incredible rise, but uh, how can AI be used, uh, artificial intelligence be used uh, with the data being generated from these assays. Uh, so Leo, maybe you can lead this one. So we've already been, we've already started implementing AI in just in our routine uh, workflows actually. So the um, a large proportion of the um, readouts that we obtain from our in vitro cultures, partic um, particularly from the organoid cultures are high content. And these are 3D cultures. So we have a huge amount of data, you know, from each well of a 384 well plate, we, take you know maybe a hundred images and in each one of those images there's there's information on on the organoids that are in there and so all of that information is extracted from the images and um we use um ai tools to scan through those images and and basically identify characteristics like the nuclei the cells the organoids by doing some pre-training we can teach the ai tools how to do that and so that information can be extracted and and it's accurate and it speeds up um, all of our analyses. So already that's had a very uh, positive impact. But I think there are also, you know, there are a lot, there's lots more that can be done. So the data that the, the high content data that are extracted from, uh, from these images is, is really high dimensional. It can be hundreds and hundreds of features. And so that presents an interesting opportunity to, to take that complex data and put it alongside other complex omics data, be it proteomics or genomics, and start to look for um, interesting associations. I mean, I think in the in the past, you know, if you take complex genetic data, and then on the other side, you have relatively simple readout, and it might be tumor shrinkage, yes or no, or uh, an EC50, it's, there's, there's much less information to leverage. But with a complex data, data set on both sides, you can really um, uh, do some very uh, interesting analyses and extract more information and make more interesting associations. So I think uh, there's there's we're just getting started in 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 Crown with our use of AI to to analyze uh, our data, make that you make most use of the data as possible, and and then also um, to link that up to other publicly available data, and then also our own internal databases of uh, uh, sequencing data, for example. Yeah, and also to, to add to this point, uh, Leo mentioned, and we have a huge characterization, so all those information can be indeed used uh, to either uh, look at, for instance, biomarker uh, discovery, and, and we have also other supporting platform uh, that can be used where we have proteomics, uh, so we can uh, also the, do some deep uh, proteomics and phosphoproteomics analysis combined with the with genomics. So all multiomics approach uh, combined with the phenotyping uh, uh, characterization uh, and also linking with uh, in vivo data. Uh, so all those data set uh, can be can be used uh, to uh, to uh, to have more deep dive in terms of of, of um, stratification of response uh, for some drugs or or uh, also as I mentioned on biomarker discovery brilliant well um i think to wrap things up we'll ask you three but we'll also ask the audience uh what do you believe are the greatest developments for preclinical testing of io therapeutics um and kara maybe you can lead this one yeah, I, th I think there are a lot, uh, but I think one of these uh, that we have been discussing uh, multiple times now during the webinars and also here today is, is the organoid technology. 
Uh, and not only the organoids directly from the patient, but also, as mentioned, the, the organoids that are derived from the, from the PDX mice collection that we have. Um, and using those organoids in, in, uh, in, in a, try to reconstitute basically the tumor microenvironment. So really performing co-cultures together with um, immune cells from different subsets, um, including uh, potentially also other cells like stromal cells, and, and yeah, really try to um, mimic basically the, the tumor microenvironment of the patients um, in vitro. Um, and also because, as, as just mentioned, that all the, the data that is, uh, is already available from these uh, organoid models can also really help um, to, on one hand, first identify which models are the best to use for your specific um, uh, potential uh, uh, yeah, drug development that you are uh, trying to achieve. Um, but on the other hand, um, yeah, m really making use of, um, uh, of this tumor microenvironment and to complete it. So I think organoid models are really, um, uh, yeah, really exciting uh, development in the field. I think that my vote would have to go to the ex vivo patient tissue testing. I think, you know, I think it's a very exciting uh, development. We could consider it the sort of the next generation of, of in vitro testing. And I think, you know, that for a couple of reasons, I mean, one really important one is, is that these tissues uh, in the assays, they're sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors can actually induce enhanced killing with these drugs. And, and that's something that's not been recapitulated as far as I'm aware, in any other in vitro assay. So I think that that's a really important step forward, you know, that in this, you know, the fastest growing class of therapeutics that we, you know, we do have some in vitro assays that can be used to, uh, um, you know, to test those. And so I think that in my view, I think that that's a great uh, step forward. And I think, you know, where we're going to go with this patient tissue is also exciting. I think it can be applied uh, to clinical trials, uh, it can support clinical trials. And, you know, once we've, uh, for example, tested a, a new therapeutic, potential therapeutic in, in this assay, and we can show that, that this therapeutic is able to discriminate responders and non-responders, that this can actually be used to help in the selection of patients for clinical trials. And these clinical trials are brutally expensive. And so in the early stage, if you just want to prove that, the, that this compound can work, if you can use that to this assay to actually select uh, the patients and uh, enrich that population, then um, you can you can get an insight whether the therapeutics actually can eventually can work in 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 a population with uh, with a much smaller trial. So I think that that that's going to have uh, some you know some big impact on on reducing clinical trial costs. I don't think. So in, in, in my view, what is really uh, interesting is what organoids or ex vivo tissue platform brings in terms of uh, getting an in vitro translational platform, which can really help uh, to, to fast track and foster the drug development. And particularly, uh, it's almost impossible to test uh, a multiple uh, hundred of different combination uh, which uh, in, in, in vivo and actually this is also what is happening in clinical trial where uh, there is a lot of different combinations that are tested but uh, I think that could be then better uh, defined and refined uh, at early stage uh, particularly in, in vitro uh, uh, let's say uh, selecting the few uh, combinations that show the, the most uh, um, promising results and then after move to in vivo and, and select those ones to, to go in the clinic. Uh, so I do think really that's going to help in terms of reducing the, the attrition uh, uh, seen in, in clinic in terms of efficacy, but also, uh, as, as mentioned before, also in terms of, of, of safety, uh, where all those questions can be addressed uh, early on. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, Ludo. Here and uh, Leo, thanks so much for your insights today. It's been uh, really a pleasure having you with us. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, everyone.
Yeah, definitely. Big thanks to everyone for joining us today. And so, yeah, in closing, we hope you enjoyed this Crown Bioscience Inside Scientific and Scientist.com webinar. And uh, we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a great day, everyone.